reflect on the uh, environmentalists that have most inspired me, I can't help but think of them in categories. There's great litigators who win the precedent-setting cases. There are the amazing policy advocates who convince elected officials and regulators and business leaders to, take, to step up and take action. And there are great communicators who craft the messages that resonate with all of us. And it's rare to find uh, anyone who, could, who possesses all of those qualities. And yet, my good fortune tonight is that I have the honor of, of introducing someone who does just, just that. Vicki Patton is the general counsel of the Environmental Defense Fund. For 20 years, she has worked to strengthen and defend our clean air programs, fighting against particulates, toxics, and carbon that threaten our children's health and our climate's stability. She has worked on important Supreme Court cases like Massachusetts versus EPA and EPA versus E&E Homer. She has worked with a willing EPA to establish more and stronger environmental protections. But she hasn't limited her efforts just to national issues. She's also had tremendous uh, local success. For instance, she's, she has helped broker important agreements to phase out coal burning in Colorado. And now as the Trump administration works to repeal the Clean Power Plan and carbon pollution standards for cars and trucks, Vicki Patton is fighting them every step of the way. Vicki is a rancher's daughter from Arizona. She was raised in the Sonora Desert and grew up, grew up feeling a strong connection to that environment. She earned an undergraduate degree there in hydrology and went on to receive a JD from New York University School of Law. After eight years at EPA's Office of General Counsel, Vicki joined EDF in Boulder, Colorado, where she has been quoted as saying she has realized her dream of working with dedicated colleagues in the fight for a healthier environment. She's won more awards than I certainly will list for you now, from Boulder County's Healthy Community Award to EPA's Gold Medal for Exceptional Service. Ricky Rivez, the Dean of New York University School of Law, might have said it best when he said, Vicki is enormously well respected in the environmental community as a thought leader and as someone with great strategic insights and extraordinary vision. For me, Vicki is simply the voice of reason and passion from the Rockies. There's truly no one better fighting on our side. So please join me in welcoming Vicki Patton to the stage. It's far-reaching and it's unprecedented in American history. It began immediately, immediately um, upon President Trump's confirmation. Um, EPA head Scott Pruitt took aim at a number of really vital uh, environmental protections. One of the first things he did is to suspend the nation's limits on oil and gas air pollution. Um, and this was sort of something that was repeated throughout kind of the first phase of the Trump rollbacks, so that is this idea of sort of suspensions. And what they did is they took these safeguards that were the, based on extensive analysis, years of public comment and input, massive sort of economic assessments to make sure that they were cost effective, anchored in you know, years of scientific research, and they believed that they had the power to just suspend them. Without public notice, without public comment, without any explanation of the health and environmental impacts of the American people. And so one of the first actions was the suspension of our nation's limits on methane pollution for oil and gas. These are nationwide standards. And when you reduce methane from oil and gas, those same technologies, those same policy solutions also reduce volatile organic compounds that form summertime smog pollution. They also reduce toxic benzene that's associated with cancer. They have a suite of really vital benefits. Scott Pruitt suspended them in early June uh, of 2017 and said, I'm just putting them on hold, just stopping them in their tracks. Now, there's a coalition of environmental groups that sued the day 
that action was published in the Federal Register. And they, they spent weeks getting ready for that moment. They spent weeks getting ready, not because the government had said, this is what we're going to do, and we want to kind of have a conversation about it in America, because that's how typically public policy works. They sued because there were leaks in the trade press of a meeting that Scott Pruitt had had at the Trump Hotel in Washington, D.C., with the executive committee of the American Petroleum Institute, where he had assured them at that meeting that he would deliver on the suspension, that he would deliver on these rollbacks. So this coalition that brought the legal action didn't have any real public notice, right? They're reading the trade press, they're trying to kind of pick up information that is being leaked about secret meetings with the American Petroleum Institute at the Trump Hotel in Washington, D.C., and preparing their legal action. On July 3rd, 2017, the D.C. Circuit struck it down. And they said Scott Pruitt's action was unlawful, arbitrary, capricious, covered contrary to law, struck down. This was repeated time and time again during sort of the first part of the Trump administration. Um, another example is that Scott Pruitt and Donald Trump had met with um, a company in, in Tennessee that made old, uh, took old diesel engines and they slipped them into a modern cab. And so you took these old diesel engines, you put them into a modern cab, and then you marketed them and sold them. Uh, they didn't meet modern clean air standards. They discharged lethal particulates at over 500 times, kind of modern, clean diesel, cleaner diesel engines do. Oxides of nitrogen at about um, 40 times more than modern clean air standards. But Trump and Scott Pruitt had met with Tommy Fitzgerald in Tennessee, and they had become convinced that this, these clean air standards should not apply to these super polluting diesel engines called gliders. And so Pruitt initiated a rulemaking to try to kind of get rid of this. There was a huge sort of coalition of groups that wrote detailed comments and explained to him why this was unlawful um, and why it would have very serious public health and environmental harm. And in the face of those comments, kind of Pruitt was stymied. He wasn't sure about what to do next. And so engulfed in controversy, due to sort of his corrupt management practices, his running roughshod over our nation's um, environmental laws. Pruitt sort of was on his way out, right? Headed out of, uh, out of office in um, early June of uh, 2018. And the last thing he did, the last thing he did on his way out is not being able to complete this rulemaking to kind of roll back these clean air protections at the behest of the Fitzgeralds Pruitt just issued a memo and said, I'm not going to enforce these. A couple of pages of memo. I hereby declare that it is the policy of EPA not to enforce these clean air safeguards for these high polluting diesel engines. Now remember, America is this pioneer of clean, air, clean you know, diesel technology. So he's, Pruitt is creating this loophole for these high polluting diesel engines for the Fitzgeralds at the same time that in places like Columbus, Indiana, and all other parts of the heartland, America is manufacturing sort of the cleanest diesel engines in the world and creating jobs and creating you know, new technologies, advanced technologies. Um, Cummins is one of the world's leading diesel engine manufacturers located in, in the heartland of Columbus, Indiana, and meeting you know, these, these really important clean air standards. So Pruitt gives them this no action assurance. I'm not going to enforce these actions. And again, coalition was ready and took legal action. Um, the coalition requested emergency relief. They asked the court to sort of immediately block this rollback, demonstrating that it caused sort of immediate harm. Um, and they said, you know, put, it, put a hold on this, put a pause on this while we then sort of litigate uh, the merits. And within 24 hours of filing for emergency relief, the court um, enjoined uh, Pruitt's action. Then, um, a gentleman named Andy Wheeler became acting administrator of EPA. And um, in the face of sort of this legal loss, he eventually sort of withdrew the policy. This, this was repeated throughout 
the first phase of Pruitt's, of Pruitt's tenure, during Pruitt's tenure, in the first phase of the Trump administration, a number of actions. It included suspending, just categorically suspending protections that affect um, and are designed to sort of serve the first responders in the face of chemical risk management and disasters. So think about the first responders that went into the Arkema facility to try to protect kind of the neighborhood and the community at risk in the context of, the, uh, of Hurricane Harvey in Houston. They're supposed to sort of have information about some of the dangerous chemicals that are stored on site and the risks that it poses to them and the community. So one of the things Pruitt had done is just suspend those you know, really important sort of protections for chemical risk management. It happened sort of across government on environmental policy. Um, Secretary Zinke just suspended without public notice, without public comment, uh, uh, standards that were designed to uh, minimize uh, the waste of oil and gas, of methane, on public and tribal lands, just categorically suspended them. Um, this was repeated um, in the protections of clean water. Uh, again, just suspensions of, of really uh, critical protections. All of these sort of body of rollbacks and suspensions are categorized and readily available for you to kind of see and take a look at on a tracker that the Harvard uh, Environmental Energy Law Program posts on its website. It's called the Regulatory Rollback Tracker. So you can just search this and what you'll see is that there are over 50 actions all across our government where your public health and environmental protections have been sort of under attack. You can see sort of the status of each of those. The good news is that the rule of law worked. The good news is that there were judges, Republican, pointed by Republican presidents, Democratic presidents, in all parts of the country, South Carolina, Washington, D.C., California, who struck these actions down. This first kind of round of attacks and suspensions. Uh, there's a terrific white paper that's been uh, pulled together by uh, a group called the Institute for Policy Integrity at NYU School of Law. It's called Deregulation Run Amok. And it examines this body of cases that come out of sort of this first part of the Trump administration where the rule of law worked, where environmental attorneys all across America kind of stood up, made their case in a court of law, adduced massive sort of factual analysis, legal analysis, and explained in our system of government that these actions were unlawful. And by and large, they were struck down. Now we're in kind of the next phase of the Trump administration's sort of rollbacks, where they're purporting to take action in a way that is kind of consistent with notice and comment rulemaking. And they're purporting to say that they're explaining themselves. And some of the actions um, that they're pursuing are really unraveling the most important climate safeguards in our country. These are sort of the leading climate sort of protections in the world. These are the climate protections that kind of inspired the world to commit to the Paris Climate Accord, and they are now under threat. One of the things that they're doing is rolling back virtually every climate and air protection that affects coal plants. So what does that look like? What that means is that they are proposing to repeal the Clean Power Plan. These are the carbon pollution limits on existing coal plants. They're proposing to dramatically weaken the carbon pollution limits that apply to new coal plants. They're proposing to sort of revise and potentially repeal the limits on mercury, arsenic, and acid gases from coal plants. These are toxic limits that have, were adopted in 2011. They're fully implemented. Fully implemented. Limits on mercury, arsenic, acid gas is fully carried out. And indeed, this summer, a coalition of businesses urged EPA to leave them alone. That coalition included the Edison Electric Institute, that's a coalition of investor owned utilities, the National Rural Electric Cooperatives, the Rural Electric Co op said, do not touch this, leave this alone. American Public Power Association, Public Power saying, 
Leave this alone. Do not roll back these limits on nuclear toxicity. Um, there were a number of labor organizations, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the American Lung Association. When has there been a coalition like that in American life that has gone to our government and said, don't do this? Nevertheless, they proceeded and they did it, you know, um, in the holidays, right between sort of Christmas and New Year's. They proposed to sort of damage, deeply damage these limits on mercury, arsenic, and acid gases. At the same time, they're proposing to um, provide a massive multi-billion dollar bailout for coal plants. Um, they've, um, a memo leaked last summer laying out sort of their theory for how they would do this. One of the theories was that they would use an arcane law called the Defense Production Act, and they would sort of effectuate a major transfer of wealth from you, from American sort of consumers to coal barons, basically, by propping up multi-billion dollar investment um, and keeping aging, high polluting coal plants running. The cynicism of what they're doing is, is, um, is extensive. Um, Andy Wheeler, um, at the end of the summer, took two actions to kind of demonstrate just how cynical um, they are. When he proposed to repeal the Clean Power Plan, um, the acting administrator of EPA, Andy Wheeler, said, look, I want to repeal the Clean Power Plan because I believe that states should have kind of complete prerogative about how much carbon pollution is discharged from coal plants. I don't want to interfere with the prerogative of the states to do this. At the same time, at the same time, he proposed to essentially gut our nation's clean car standards, including, including the landmark protections that have forced, the were forged in law in 1967 that enabled states, California and a number of other states, to protect millions of people from motor vehicle pollution. So our nation's clean cars program includes these na national standards, but it has always included, since 1967, for over 50 years, state leadership, a state-based program led by California, where California, because of the really pressing challenges it faces in terms of human health and environmental harms from tailpipes, has long had the authority to protect its citizens from harmful tailpipe pollution. Oregon and many other states all across the country have a long partnered with California in adopting these standards. And so, and so Andy Wheeler said, well, I can't, I've got to roll back the Clean Power Plan because I've got to protect states' prerogatives to kind of decide whatever they want to do in terms of carbon pollution. But at the same time, I'm going to virtually eviscerate the U.S. Clean Car Program, and I'm going to preempt the state program. I'm going to preempt the state program. I'm going to sort of strip away the state's rights to protect millions of people from <laughs> dangerous climate pollution. Why? Why do we think, I mean, this is not normal, right? This, this, is, this has never happened before in, in American life, that we've had sort of our public health and environmental protections so under siege. So why, why should we be hopeful at this really bleak moment? One of the reasons that we should be hopeful is because the rule of law has been resilient. That's a reason to be hopeful. Another reason to be hopeful is because in this face of sort of darkness, in this moment of corruption, so many, so many have acted. Um, Tuesday night, former Ohio uh, governor, Republican, John Kasich said in a, in a major speech, it is time for the Republican Party to stop denying the climate science and to act. In the fall, Senate Pro Tem in California, Kevin DeLeon, successfully ushered through SB 100, which commits California to 100% carbon-free energy by 2045. A couple of days ago, the governor of Maine, Janet Mills, became the 22nd, the 22nd governor 
to join the U.S. Climate Alliance. This is governors all across America who are saying, we are committing to the Paris Climate Goals. We are going to deliver on those in our states, even while Trump disrupts, even while Trump takes us in reverse. Um, in early February, two governors testified before the House Natural Resources Committee urging the Congress to take action on climate. Those two governors included Charlie Baker, the Republican Massachusetts governor, uh, the Republican governor of Massachusetts who has taken tremendous action on, on climate change, and Roy Cooper, the Democratic governor of North Carolina. Real like geopolitical diversity, uh, raising their voices um, before Congress and saying, we urge Congress to act. At the same time, power company in my home state of Colorado um, that has generating assets in eight mid-continent states, including the Dakotas, Michigan, Texas, Colorado, New Mexico, in December announced that it was committing to 100% decarbonization of its um, electricity system by 2050 and 80% by 2030. They said, we can completely decarbonize our power system, we can do it cost effectively, and we can achieve an 80% reduction by 2030. There's all sorts of actions that are happening all across America in the face of this darkness that give us reason for hope. And in this dynamic landscape, in this dynamic landscape, there is an opportunity to think about common ground, right? Because sort of the debate is changing before our very eyes. And it's, you know, we've got on the one hand these rollbacks, this disruption, this moment of darkness nationally, and then we have this movement that's getting created, right? Where people are demonstrating that we can decarbonize and states are leading, and cities are stepping up and leading. The private sector is taking action. Young people are raising their voices and calling on their leaders to act. So what do we do to forge common ground? A few thoughts, and I welcome you know, your, your ideas and, and hope that you'll share them. Um, one, we must talk about climate change. Um, Catherine Hayhoe was this amazing climate scientist gave a TED talk at the end of the year where she said the single most important thing we need to do to forge common ground is to talk about climate change. Have you ever sort of had that moment where you thought, gosh, I'm in a situation and I'm not really sure I should talk about climate change? Don't do that. Let's talk about climate change. Never be afraid to talk about climate change. The research that she shared indicates that the number one explanation for climate denialism is not in any way related to education. It's not in any way related to your understanding of the science. It's where you fall in the political spectrum. That is the number one indicator. Where you fall in the political spectrum. How do we talk about climate change? How do we start forging common ground. Well, she says, share values. Try to find a way to kind of connect with people through your shared values. There's an organization that is affiliated with Environmental Defense Fund called Moms Clean Air Force that was just formed a few years ago. And in a very short span of time, very short span of time, it's over a million moms. <coughs> and it's a million moms all across America who have the shared value of protecting climate safety, clean air for their kids. It's an abiding, it's, it's an abiding way that people are united in this vision for their children. It includes military moms, evangelical moms, Latina moms, African American moms, all committed to climate safety for their children and for all children. This is what we've got to do. We've got to find a way to, to talk about climate change. The other thing we need to do is we need to build partnerships. 
How do we build partnerships? It's happening in this litigation that's, that's, that's going on against the Trump administration. The coalition that is litigating against Trump's rollback of the BLM methane waste prevention standards that are supposed to protect tribal and public lands includes DNA Care. DNA Care is committed to indigenous rights and protecting the health and safety of the Navajo people. DNA Care's leadership in that litigation is critical. These are the partnerships we need, right? These are the partnerships we need to forge. We need to look sort of far and wide and try to sort of expand and think about sort of what are the, what are the partnerships we can, we can make in everything we do. The coalition that's litigating to protect our nation's clean car standards and includes LIFT. It includes 22 state attorneys general. It includes numerous cities all across America, including in Michigan. It includes uh, the advanced energy economy, which includes Honda as one of its members. We need partners. We need as many partners as we can, we can find. So think about opportunities for partnership in the fight against climate change. And then the other thing we need to do is we need, we need to forge common ground in acting on climate change. And if you think of just about just even the last few months, it's been really remarkable. Um, in terms of those who have demonstrated sort of a whole new bold vision for climate action and forging common ground in climate change. It includes everyone from the Youth in the Sunrise Movement who raised their voices at a really defining moment, right? And they called on the new Democratic leadership they called on Speaker Nancy Pelosi to take climate change with the seriousness that it deserves, with the seriousness that it warrants. They weren't satisfied just to have Democrats win the House. They said, you need to deliver, you need to act. Well, who is the Sunrise Movement? It's young people of all perspectives, all backgrounds, who've come together around their kind of commitment to climate action. There's some great articles about the breadth and the diversity of the young people in that coalition who are standing together. There are young people who are litigating in the Juliana case, right, who have locked arms, reflecting a wide variety of views and perspectives, who are calling on their government to sort of address their grievances and, and, and address the injuries that they face from climate change. There's a congresswoman who represents the Queens and the Bronx, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who's formed an incredible coalition, right, that includes justice groups and, and, and frontline communities and people who've been far too long left behind in the conversation and, and, the, and the urgent need to address climate change. And she is giving them a voice and she is raising her voice. And in a moment, she has changed the conversation. She's changed the conversation about climate change. And then just yesterday, a governor said he was going to run for president of the United States because he believes beating climate change is the single most important challenge we face. And what is the coalition that he's forming? He's reaching out to every single American, right? He's going to build a conversation and build partnerships and build action in addressing climate change. Jay Inslee said yesterday that we are the first, the first generation to feel the steam of climate change and the last, the last generation that can do anything about it. And in that moment, right, and in that moment, well, we are, in fact, the last generation that can do anything about it. Let's find common ground in talking about climate change. Let's find common ground in this dynamic moment, in this moment of darkness. Let's be beacons of hope in forming partnerships to address climate change. And let's act on climate change. Thank you.
Oh, so yeah, I'd love some questions. We have 10 to 15 minutes for questions, so please. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for all of your great work. It's a team effort. We're all in this together. <laughs> to all of biology, to the environment, and uh, aside from being, you know, a, a, a huge danger with the, um, the radiation that's going to be uh, densely uh, set up, the infrastructure is going to be on every block, every corner, you know, the small cells, it's already rolling out in Eugene here, and nobody's asked the public. And uh, it also has a huge carbon footprint, if we could even get that far with it. But it will knock us out before climate change, and I'm wondering if you know about it. I don't thank you for sharing that, and um, please feel free to send me additional information about it. Welcome. Any other comments, questions? Please jump in. Anything about? Yes. Uh, I think that climate change speaks to everybody because it affects everybody. And we have the parallel problem of the enormous disparities and rising poverty. What are some of the common ground coalitions that are organizing to make the solutions for climate change not on the backs of the impoverished? You know, the, um, the, the poor and um, the frontline communities are going to suffer the you know, most serious afflictions as a result of climate change. And um, one of the really powerful parts about the Green New Deal and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and her voice and her leadership and her vision and all of this is that you know, when, she, when she held her press conference sort of um, unveiling sort of the Green New Deal resolution, um, she said, this is first and foremost about the communities that have been left out and have been left behind. Um, and so that's a, that's a conversation changer, right? That has not been part of the dialogue and the discourse. And um, it's really important. It's, it's, it's really important. We're also seeing examples of um, communities providing solutions um, that provide for shared prosperity. There's a community in my home state, Colorado, called Pueblo. It's a manufacturing community. And they are in the process of transitioning two large coal units and replacing them with a $2.4 billion investment in large-scale solar and wind. And um, they're now um, creating um, job retraining um, at the local community college. Um, they are looking at um, uh, ramping up some of their manufacturing um, at the, one of the Vestas facilities in Pueblo. And uh, the uh, steel manufacturing facility there, which employs about 1,000 people, just negotiated a long-term contract for utility-scale solar that outcompetes the price of coal and will keep those 1,000 jobs in that community powered by, you know, with, the, with steel manufacturing, powered by utility-scale solar for several decades to come. So those are examples of where, you know, as the cost of clean energy is outcompeting the, you know, high polluting energy, um, we need to sort of make this transition just as swift and rapidly as we can and make sure that sort of the benefits are realized by the communities that are affected. To follow up on that a bit, um, so the environmental movement and labor have long been at odds. Um, I heard a great presentation yesterday from the services union about how they're on board um, to to uh, help work towards uh, at climate action. Um, but we still struggle with the trades and your thoughts on common ground 
between um, a green economy and the trades? The, um, it's really important. Um, the International uh, Brotherhood of Electrical Workers and Boilermakers um, were on the correspondence to EPA, urging EPA to leave alone the limits on mercury and, and arsenic and acid gases. Um, there has been sort of increasing involvement from the Blue Green Alliance in defending against the Trump administration's attack on our nation's clean car standards. Um, this is coming at a time when the administration is trying to drive a wedge um, between deepen kind of the divide between the environmental community and labor by arguing that these clean car standards need to be weakened, they need to be gutted and rolled back because it's imperiling uh, jobs um, in, uh, in, in the heartland. Um, so, um, if anything, I was, you know, over the last say two years, I think the conversation and the partnership with labor has been strengthened. Um, I think there's so much more that needs to happen. And again, I think with um, solutions like the Green New Deal, um, the idea is to sort of, you know, bring sort of labor into the conversation and to make sure that, um, you know, no one is left, left behind. And would welcome further thoughts about how to improve that. Thank you for speaking. Uh, oh, you, I like what you mentioned about the fossil fuels. It's very important to uh, address them because they turn into CO2 and methane, which are all very strong greenhouse gases. But uh, have you heard of the comparison or the pa parallel effects that animal agriculture has on the environment? Uh, I've even heard that uh, the production of meat, dairy, and eggs is is even uh, more uh, of a problem regarding these gases and not just gases that go into the air but manure that when there's a flood goes into our drinking water and the, and the use of water from our aquifers which gets depleted very quickly and we're losing all the, the, res, the resources that this country made this country really good. Thank you for your comments. The, you know, the quest for sustainable agriculture is, you know, at best a work in progress, right? There's just so much that needs to be done to try to address the sustainability of agriculture in a way that will, you know, mitigate the impacts on climate change and in a way that will be able to feed this growing sort of planet, right? It's, as the population sort of increases. And one of the great sort of threats about climate change, there are so many, but it's this threat multiplier, right? This is how, you know, many sort of experts refer to it as a threat multiplier. And one of the threat multipliers is that, is the disruption of our food supply. And so if we don't get our arms around sort of far more sustainable sort of production of agriculture, we're actually gonna be headed in the wrong direction. And um, facing sort of the climate crisis in a context where, you know, we're creating kind of negative feedback loops. So I uh, really appreciate uh, those thoughts. And another, I think, piece of that that is where there's a lot of opportunity for partners is in food waste, right? It's, it's both the production of food, our consumption of food, but it's also our waste of food. One of the single most important things we can all do in our own lives is to try to address sort of just even the food waste. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for your excellent speech, and I appreciate the clarity and gravity that you you you, you brought. Um, I'm glad, yeah, we are all on this together, but I'm glad that you're doing what you're doing, and it's you. I don't know you, but I just really get a good, great feeling for your work, and thank you. My question is, um, in addition to everything you talked about, I think we need massive nonviolent resistance at a level that we may never have experienced in this country. And I guess my question is, will you endorse that? And I know that you're with a, an, an institution, uh, the EDF, and, and in your background at EPA, but I'm really inspired by the 
10,000 people who closed down bridges in London and all of the children in, in Europe who are striking and in America. And we need to, to reimagine ourselves, it seems to me, in a grassroots movement that we may never have seen before. We need all the levels of law professors and advocates calling for that. I'm sorry for my little speech here, but would you endorse that? Um, the, um, I think you're, you're right. We need, um, we need everything. We need lawyers and law students, right, who believe in our system of government and are willing to dedicate themselves to preparing these really complex cases and presenting sort of facts and law in a system that they have to believe in, right, that you have to put your faith in that will deliver sort of justice. Um, and that's a really important part of it. We need private sector leaders who are going to act, um, you know, and, and are committed to acting and going to drive, you know, action forward. We need public policy leaders. We need people like Jay Inslee who are going to say, this is why I'm running for president, because I, I want to, you know, defeat climate change. That is the single most important sort of challenge we face. Um, and we need um, a movement, right? We need a movement. And the young people who, at a critical moment, um, just as soon as um, the Democrats sort of won the House, said, that's not enough. That's not enough. We are going to sit in the Speaker's office and we're going to respectfully but clearly call on her to take climate change seriously had a huge impact, right? That <coughs> nonviolent, that peaceful, that civil resistance changed the conversation. And, you know, that's part of kind of American democracy. I have one more question back here, and then one final one up there, and then we're going to have to let Ms. Patton go. Well, like everyone else, um, uh, I, I really, you're an inspiration. I really appreciate everything that you're doing. Um, one, one of my thoughts with regards to climate change, which of course is very real and a very important problem, is as we shift from one poison, quote poison, like greenhouse gases, I fear we might shift to another poison, and that is nuclear power. Right, so, you know, we're having more electric cars on the roads and things like that, which is helping, of course, global warming. But then we have to get more power. And so we're, I, I fear we're going to go to more nuclear power, which, of course, creates, you know, radioactive waste. We don't have a place to put it for tens of thousands of years and causes trouble. I actually live in Richland, which is home of Hanford, the, one of the largest Superfund sites, which is all, uh, you know, the, 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 the waste from the atomic eras and the groundwater and the going to and all that kind of stuff. So first, what is your stance on <coughs> nuclear? And if it is against nuclear power, what, what are you guys doing with regards to that? Um, I think the reason we are, um, we are not likely to see more nuclear power, um, at least in this country, is because it can't compete with large scale wind and solar. Right now, um, in many parts of the country, and increasingly so, wind and solar are out competing every form of electricity generation. And, and nuclear, um, it can't compete. So you have the waste management issues, you have the proliferation issues and security issues, but you also have just the fact that nuclear is far more expensive um, and, you know, just uh, a couple weeks ago in Arizona, uh, a major power company announced 500 megawatts of energy storage that they're going to pair with large-scale solar. So, all of a sudden, what you have is a world where not only does large-scale solar and wind outcompete nuclear, but so does pairing that with storage, large-scale storage. And that's, you know, that's just a game-changer. <coughs> Um, I noticed that you worked in the EPA, and that leads to a question that's on the minds of all of us who rush home to watch Rachel Maddow on MSNBC to try to make sense of the craziness that's pouring out in Washington, D.C. right now. Um, I kind of have a question for you about uh, 
the, the, the sense of the finger on the pulse he might have about that. Um, uh, my, uh, my dad was a lieutenant colonel in the Army, Corps of Engineers, and I convinced him that climate change was real when I pointed out that uh, that radical environmental group, the U.S. Navy submarine fleet, was concerned about climate change because the, the pack ice in the North Pole was suddenly able to be broken through by submarines, it has to be three feet or less, any time of the year, and it made the North Pole a, you know, a, a theater of concern. Um, and general, of all people who are not climate change tonight, of all people who are climate change aware, General Mattis, who just got kicked out of the, uh, the Trump administration, is, was one of, the, one of the people with uh, some common sense. DC and the people who must be your compatriots working long term in the government there must be, I can't imagine how under siege they are. I know the State Department is emptied out of like, uh, experienced people. What sense do you have among people that you work with who are long-term part of the federal government of their surviving this onslaught of, of Trump's madness? And what's your, what's your sense of the pulse of things? Um, one, can you give us a hopeful? <laughs> one, um, just on, on you know, General Mattis and um, you know, national security and climate change, over, you know, Democrat, Republican administrations alike, our generals, our national security experts have said climate change is a threat multiplier. That threat multiplier comes from our national security experts, right? And, um, and one of the things that just is, is a new development in the Trump administration, I just want to flag, we all have got to keep a really close eye on, is that they're trying to see within the National Security Council sort of um, an attack on the climate science, and that's just been in the news over the last couple of, of weeks. At EPA, um, you know, it is, we've lost a number of really talented people. Um, there are also some remarkable people who are still there. Really um, important leaders, people with tremendous sort of expertise, veterans. Um, and these are the people who are going to need to be there to help kind of provide the continuity and put the pieces together. The other thing we all need to think about is we need to very best ideas we can muster about how we create that resilience and rebuild just the moment we can, right? We, we can't sort of continue to sort of ask EPA to do more, and, and we have lost, we're going to lose four years, right, of crucial progress. So how do we, at the same time, when we're restoring sort of those protections and moving forward to address kind of the really, you know, the critical lost ground how do we make sure we're rebuilding kind of the capacity at EPA and not just stretching people more thin? And is there, you know, what are the what are the ideas, the best ideas we can muster? Do we create like a core? Um, you know, Teach for America, but it's it's an EPA, right? And we have, you know, the top graduates coming out of, you know, masters in science programs and PhD programs that commit to upon graduation a two-year, four-year fellowship at EPA and we fund that and we bring in sort of an injection of science and technical expertise and energy um, immediately, right? And we and we create a way for all of us to kind of roll up our sleeves and work together and rebuild and, and, and double down on the commitment. The only, the only silver lining of the Trump's repeated sort of attacks on our government and the shutdown is that it has raised Americans' awareness about the vital services that the government delivers, right? And so that's part of bearing witness at that at this moment, sort of engaging Americans and saying, look at these services that the EPA provides. Do you value clean air? Do you value clean water? Do we finally need to fix the you know poisonous water in Flint? We absolutely do. And let's bring a core of you know graduating you know scientists and engineers. Um, into EPA in large numbers and say do a two or a four year fellowship and help us rebuild and help us, you know, um, be the beacons of hope um, that kind of restore America after this moment of darkness.